Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and our study of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, and our look at sowing and reaping. What does the Bible say? And what does the Bible not say? This study will serve to encourage proper attitudes and motives in our giving, while exposing the perverted tactic of the charlatans who seek to use these passages to fleece the flock. We now join our study in progress of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. In 2 Corinthians 9, it's a short chapter, but you see the graphic there as a man, he's walking around and sowing seed. Now, today's typical message would be about money. And there is a place for that. But the Bible emphasis on sowing is on you sowing the seed of the gospel. Amen. If you want to sow and please God, be a gospel seed sower first and foremost. Along with that, sow other seed, including giving to the work of the ministry, spending time in the ministry, and I don't mean some ordained ministry, I mean preaching the gospel and reaching out to people and finding people with needs and doing things, uh, witnessing to those you work with, no matter what it is. So we're going to see that as we go through this um, chapter. I want to start in verses 1 and 2. Go ahead and read those verses with me. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So he begins this chapter by uh, continuing along the lines of chapter 8, which we uh, went through verse by verse, of Corinth having this Macedonian mindset that we refer to of wanting to be zealous in their giving, looking for opportunities to be used of God. He says it's superfluous for me to write to you. In other words, he, he's kind of overdoing it even by mentioning this. But it's necessary, so he goes ahead and does it. And he says, because um, he, he knows their forwardness. Uh, the forwardness of their mind. Have you ever heard the term of, uh, boy, that, she's very forward. That's what they used to call girls who would call boys. <laughs> they say she was a, she's very forward. What are you laughing about, Mariah? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so that same idea of forwardness is the, the way Corinth was actually behaving in their, in their giving. Forward. I, as a pastor, that's what you want. You want to see people are just wanting to give, 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 not just in the offering box. <laughs> give, give, give to others and, and ministry and doing that sort of thing. And that's what Paul was talking about. He says, for which I boast of you. So there's a lot of boasting going on with Paul, but it's not boasting about how you know, great their business is and how you know, their, their, their uh, other worldly things. It's boasting in them and how they serve the Lord and they have a forwardness. And it, it closes ver the verse by saying... Um, their zeal hath provoked very many. People think of that word zeal and zealot as a bad word, and it's not a bad word. The only time the Bible says zealousness is bad is when it's without knowledge. Be a zealot, brother. Just be a zealot on the truth. Be a zealot for preaching the gospel. Be a zealot for helping others. Be a zealot for things that God says that we should do. But he also, in saying that we should be zealous givers, this should translate into a couple of things I want to emphasize, and that is, number one, wise and thoughtful effort. You ought to pray about these things and think about them. How can I give? How can I minister? How can I be used of God? Ask the questions that God wants you to ask, and that is, what is He calling you to do? What is He pushing you to do? And how can I do that in a wise and thoughtful manner? And so there's got to be wisdom and thought to it, but also meaningful results. In other words, I don't run around giving away the DVDs the way I give away the fellowship tracks. Why? Because they're more expensive. Amen. So we want to be a good steward. We're seed sowers. Yeah. And you are out sowing seed 
Whether you're preaching the gospel or even ministering to others, you're actually sowing seed. You should always preach the gospel, but you should also do those other things. Don't leave the other undone. If you're fishing like this, don't expect to get results. And I'm hoping this guy is not serious. It's just a big pothole and he's got his line dropped in there trying to fish. But if you fish in mud puddles, don't be surprised when you're eating crackers and spam for dinner. But that's what I mean by, that's what a lot of Christians look like when they're ministering. Um, we want to be wise about it. And he goes on and talks more about this on the lines of wisdom in verses 3 and 4. Read those verses with me. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. He's not taking anything for granted. In other words, he says, I know you're zealous, you're forward forgiving, you want to do the right thing, but just in case, <laughs> I'm going to send Titus and that other brother down so they can just help make sure that you're ready. In other words, there's nothing wrong with responsibility and accountability. That's why there's nothing wrong with, even though I'm pretty sure across the board, everyone in here is thoughtful and they want to preach the gospel and all that, there's still nothing wrong with me bringing it up and exhorting you to continue. That's why I share information with you about groups that I would not send money to. Amen. Because you want to be responsible and, and be, you're going, we are held accountable. You know, there's some people think they can just drop money in the plate, so they continue going to liberal churches and dropping money in the plate, and they don't realize that will burn on Judgment Day. Amen. You just gave money to a cult. Liberalism is a cult. The Roman Catholic Church is a cult. Amen. These cults, when you give money to them, your money will not be rewarded because you were not thoughtful and responsible in your giving. So you want to be careful who you give money to. And then in verse 5, read that with me. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Uh, the kids used to like it when I'd come across these words. I'd read the Bible and I'd say, and make up before your bounty. You know, because it's, <laughs> it sounds like a pirate. But uh, the word bounty, <laughs> it doesn't always pertain to pirates. The word bounty is basically the, 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 uh, like your bank account is, uh, is your bounty. And when we sent the Christmas boxes out and Direct Line Ministry sent the bounty, that's the same thing. And so uh, he wants them to have it made up beforehand and to be ready. And, it, and Paul, again, is simply being thoughtful and tactful. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people think there's something spiritual about not being thoughtful and tactful about how they do things. Paul's sending these guys down there, not because he doesn't trust them, but just to, it's just in, intelligent. It's just a good thing to do, to never take things for granted and to be thoughtful and tactful. Now, here's a verse that um, a lot of times preachers will take this one verse and, man, they can preach for an hour on this uh, because they like to, you know, to use it in a certain way. But in verse 6, read that with me. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And at this point, then I start waxing eloquent about how if you don't give to the Lord, then no wonder your faucet's broken down and your sump pump blew out in the middle of the flood and your roof has a hole in it, you know, and all that sort of thing. Well, hey, there is some truth to that. I've experienced it. I didn't, I, way back there, I learned this lesson, you know, this back when I was with Ray Thompson down there in Southwest Church. And I didn't tithe because I didn't think I could afford it. And about six weeks later, my car blew out and it was almost the exact amount of money I should have tithed. Don't tell me that was a coincidence. And, you know, I tell my girls, I'm, I, I'm not going to do this with them the rest of their life, but I sit down with Mariah, you know, she's working, and I'm like, you know, are you tied? I, you need to tie, uh, tie as a minimum. Now, if you want to give more than that, that's something you need to talk to the Lord about. 
And you say, well, why would you do Because that's my job as a parent is to show them how to do this. Now when she moves out, has her own life, if she doesn't want to tithe then, she'll learn her lessons the hard way. But as a parent and as your pastor, now I do the same thing with you. You don't give, I believe, a minimum of the standard from, from the time of... Uh, I think you go back to uh, Cain and Abel. I think Abel was offering a tenth, at least, when he offered that sacrifice. I think I know Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek. That was before the law. The law actually had more than one tithe. So you want to get under the law, you're going to be given a lot more than a tithe. And then you come to the New Testament, and I think it should just flow, and that's why the Bible doesn't use the tithe. The tithe's kind of a minimum. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be the local church. I can't teach that because I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. This is not the storehouse. People go to Malachi and use storehouse tithing. The storehouse is in Jerusalem in the temple. There is no temple. There is no storehouse right now. But what I do believe is that as giving a minimum of 10% and then above is the New Testament standard. And why do you give the local church then? Well, because I just think it makes sense. And I'm telling you, I told you this when I was an assistant pastor. I tell you the same thing when I wasn't even on staff. I believe where you go to church, you're using the facility, you're using the electricity, you're taking part in the food, you're getting you know, all the benefit, radio program, whatever. I wouldn't tell you you have to do any of this, but I just think it's biblical common sense that you should support that work. That's like you going, coming over to my house and eating every day and never offering to help pay for groceries. That's the way I feel about coming to church. Getting back specifically to this text, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. That does include money, but not money per se. This isn't just about money. This is about everything you do. If you sow sparingly into the lives of others, don't expect a lot of input into your life from others. If you're not sowing outwardly, don't expect it to return. It does say if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. And that, this then is made into some law, and then they elaborate on it, and this is what all the word faith teachers and the TV evangelists use, and they tell you, if you see, sow your seed of $1,000 into this ministry, God will bless you and tenfold. And suckers, for about 30 years of my life, I've watched them do it, and they, it doesn't work that way. You're sowing into the televangelist ministries, you help them live like kings, and it doesn't benefit you. Why? Because most of their ministries are a waste of your money anyway. Amen. You're not giving it into a biblical ministry to begin with. And, and by the way, a lot of people said you shouldn't speak out against this, you, know, you shouldn't talk about other ministries. Hogwash. Those ministries are liars, they're deceivers, and the reason why so many little old ladies are giving their paychecks over to these guys is because spineless preachers have refused to speak honestly to them over the years. So these little old ladies don't have the discernment they ought to have. And it all comes back on that man up in the pulpit who didn't have the spine to speak the truth about it. As you guys get older and you men turn to the little old men and the you know, women turn into little old women, you better not give your social security checks to those bums on the TV because you're not giving it to God's ministry and you're not going to reap bountifully from it. So you, it does give two rules that we do recognize. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, reap also bountifully. And I want to say one more thing. You note the ending of those words. That E-T-H, that Elizabethan, the word soweth means to presently and continuously sow. In other words, this is not just a one-time thing, this is a lifestyle. But your Vatican versions lose that, and it comes across as a one-time act or a single act, to sow sparingly. No, soweth. Presently and continuously, you lose that in your new versions. But this biblical teaching on sowing and reaping is perverted by false teachers. And they turn it into all about money, Here's an example. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. I know you've heard this uh, passage, and many of you have heard it used wrong. Luke 6, 38. Go ahead and read it with me. Give, and it shall be given unto you. 
good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, the teaching is that if you give to this ministry, then you're going to receive from God overflowing and blah, blah, you know. Well, it's not really what it said. Isn't it interesting that we are told of implications in this verse, but we're never told to have this as our motivation? Do you notice that? In Luke 6.38, we're told of the implications, not motivation. In other words, you're not supposed to give so that you can get it. He's telling you the implications. He's not giving you motivation. And too, too many Christians today solely give with the motive of receiving. And you also notice that this is not about gaining from God, but about sowing and reaping among men. Have you noticed that? See, you'll hear these verses used and repeated falsely so many times you lose track of what it really is saying. Let's look at the verse again. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. This isn't about getting something from God. This Jesus is teaching you common sense, really, that if you give to other people, again, your time, your talent, your effort, your prayer, your blood, sweat, and tears, and yes, when necessary, money. People will respond to that. So this text teaches the practical truth of the implications of giving generously and bountifully. It does not teach a so-called key to prosperity. You will have people out there selling, by the way, their messages for 1995, a series of messages, called the Keys to Prosperity. And this is one of the keys that they will use to teach you how to get rich. Any man whose ministry is to teach you a get-rich scheme from the Bible is a pervert. Because that is not what the Bible is about. That's not what Luke 6.38 is about. That's not what 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is about. Here's another example. So example number two, from Galatians. I know some of you heard this along the sowing and reaping. Read that with me. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Do you, do you see money in there? I don't see money in there at all. And you can read the whole chapter, and it is not telling you about money. But right there in the text, or in the text, it's clear. It's not specifically referring to money. Money is implied, but as are all forms of sowing. So when God tells you to be giving, yes, money is part of it. Anything you have is part of it, but it's not primarily about money. It's about you being a giver. So that then takes us back to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. And that is, you're giving, you're not giving with the motivation to receive, but we are told the implications, and for that reason, we ought to be, what we, we see here, a cheerful, cheerful giver. Read verse 7 with me. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So right there, it doesn't say tithe. It says, according as you purposeth in your heart. That means it can change. It's not a constant standard. So saying 10% is, is, uh, as a hard, fast rule obviously doesn't apply. But it's about your heart. And folks, your heart will reveal itself in the way you give. Your heart, as Galatians said, if you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh. In other words, it's not necessarily talking about sin. That means if you, all you're about is getting toys for yourself, or, you know, all your, I'm not looking at you because I, I'm just saying. <laughs> if all you think about is giving to get something that you can use in a fleshly sense, that's what you're going to reap. 
Come Judgment Day, for example, what we just talked, John just talked about. You spend all your time and money on flesh, that's what you're going to see on Judgment Day. You spend all your time and money in the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, that's what you're going to see on Judgment Day. But it also affects your life here on earth. Some of the lonely Christians I know, some of the people who don't have you know, anything to show for years of uh, being a Christian, they have not sown, they have not given, they have not invested is one way of putting it. And that's why they end up where they're at. Some Christians have gone to church, they knew it was a fleshly church, it was not a spirit-filled church, they weren't preaching the gospel, and they come to the end of their life alone. None of those people are anywhere to be seen. And if you give with the right motive, you understand the implications. And we're going to get to really the bottom line is Jesus Himself. Jesus Himself should be your motivation for giving. And if that's your motivation, then you give cheerfully. You're not weeping as you drop that money into the plate. <laughs> you're not weeping as you give up that thing. or You're not begrudging the time you lose, so to speak. Because you're doing it motivated by the giver, Jesus Christ. All good gifts come from above, from the Father of lights. So God never presents giving as any key, but simply as an opportunity. Get that one down if you're taking notes. <laughs> God never presents giving as a key, but it's an opportunity. And God loves a cheerful giver, not a greedy, self-motivated giver. Um, I had somebody write me very recently. I've been tithing and it's not working. And I wrote back and I said, uh, that's not why you tithe. And so I would say right off, God's trying to teach you something. Because your motivation's wrong. You're tithing because you think that's like insurance. That's not how it works. You give understanding the implications, but if your motivation is to receive, you've totally lost it. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. And there it is. God will take care of your needs so that we can do His work, not so we can live the good life. That's, God takes care of your needs. And if your needs are being met, you have nothing to complain about. And if you complain when your needs are being met, you just show you got a bad attitude. You have a bad spirit. <laughs> now, I'll read a few, few verses here uh, as we continue. This is where we now come down to some narrative. He says, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth Seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So, that's the implications, again. Not your motivation, but the implications, again, that your needs will be met. Only a twisted mind would take these passages to teach some sort of get-rich-with-God scheme. We can't say that enough. I mean, as soon as you hear somebody taking that approach, turn them off. You're done with them. They have already shown they have a bad spirit. They have a bad motivation themselves for whatever they're teaching. Verses 11 and 12. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. That's us. <laughs> Which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. We're thankful. And we then express thanksgiving. Because God takes care of us. And our motivation for giving is in response to that, not to get it. You see that? He continues, For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Now the way the word want is used biblically is not exactly the same as the way people use it today. I want that video game. <laughs> you know. Now a want in the biblical sense is a need. And He supplies all of your wants in the sense of your needs. 
And verses 13 and 14, now we get to the crux, the bottom line, the source of your motivation. What ought to drive your giving? Read verses 13 and 14 with me. Whiles by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men and by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. You see, you're motivated by your subjection to the gospel. Jesus Christ came from heaven giving up everything that belongs to the Son of God to become Son of Man, walking in the flesh. Gave it all up. A place where He never experienced being weary, never experienced hunger, never experienced a whip on His back, never experienced crowns, crown of thorns on His head, never experienced nails going through His skin, never experiencing being lifted up naked on a cross, bearing the shame and reproach of our sin. He gave all that up to come down and experience that. And we, in response, subject ourselves to that very example. And that is being our subjection unto the gospel of Christ. And then that grace that we receive is a power in us. And it then exudes from us when we allow it to. When we allow ourselves to live under that motivation, then you can't help it. You're going to be a giver. Just as surely as you breathe without thinking. As surely as your heart beats without you having to tell it to. When you are under subjection of the gospel of Christ, you will be a giver. And so you are not giving, then you are not exposing that gospel and grace that you profess to have received. And then finally, verse 15, read that with me. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. And there you have it. Think of what God gave in Jesus. Now give accordingly. Think of what God gave in Jesus. And you won't even have to ask. It'll just be there. Give. And for Jesus to bear the reproach and shame He bore, we will be motivated to preach the gospel even when they'll roll their eyes, they'll scoff, they'll refuse it, they'll shut the door or won't answer the door in the first place, whatever the case. If Jesus could bear that shame and reproach, why wouldn't we? And that's why we can say thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Because we see Jesus dying on the cross in our place, paying for our sin and providing for our eternal salvation. That blood that was shed was shed for you. Now respond accordingly. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of MP3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.